She dreamed that a letter had been written down in that awful place by some tortured soul, and a request had been made that the letter be delivered to someone living above. This is most unusual, but your request has been granted. We shall carry this letter to its final destination. When I graduated from the elementary age Sunday school classes to the junior high youth group, I was excited. I was already spending my Sunday nights teaching a preschool class, something none of my peers were doing. And as someone who had been told how mature I was for my age, I was ready to move on to something more adult on Sunday mornings as well. What I couldn't have expected was that joining the junior high program at my church would be the beginning of my experience with real religious trauma. Although I'd been pressured to convert people since I was about in the second grade, I was introduced to personal guilt over strangers not being saved, and the fact that if I didn't personally witness to them, it was on me that they were going to hell. This belief system was backed up by the massive wall of chick tracks that was located in our youth group room. There was a chick track for just about every fundamentalist belief you could think of. Abortions, suicide, Catholicism, Halloween, and the one that effed me up the most, a tract called The Letter. Hi, I'm Andy, and my pronouns are they, them. Today on the pod, we're talking about Jack Chick and his racist, homophobic, fundamentalist cartoon tracks through the lens of what I was being taught as a 12-year-old. The insidious nature of these tracks in particular has to do with the fact that they're presented as cartoons and are thus way more appealing to children. All their message does is reaffirm and often even take fundamentalism farther than the theology we were taught at church and at school. A combination of an unhinged youth group leader and being introduced to these tracks set the foundation for my religious trauma for years to come. Welcome to the Assigned Christian at Birth Halloween special. Today's episode of Morning Thoughts will be interspersed with short summaries of four Halloween chick tracks so that you can get a feel for their vibe. For those of you who stay till the end, you'll be treated to a full dramatic reading of The Letter, narrated by myself and my wife. Let's get into it. The first track I'm going to show you something from is about a group of kids who go trick-or-treating and find a haunted house set up in their neighborhood. Once inside, the haunted house is so scary that the boys run out of the house and immediately into the street where one of them is hit by a car and killed in front of the rest of them. The rest of the track involves two of the boys who survived being told by their Sunday school teacher that the boy who died wasn't a Christian and was therefore in hell. Chick really drives the point home that good people don't go to heaven and that we're all born sinners anyway who deserve to be in hell. In the end, one of the boys gets traumatized into accepting Jesus into his heart so that he doesn't go to hell like his friend. Feel free to pause if you want to read these strips from the track. I'm not going to show the entire track of each of these ones I'm talking about, otherwise we would be here all day. I do have the links for these in the description if you want to see the whole thing. At Calvary Community Church in Phoenix, Arizona in the 1990s, the junior high girls small group I was put into was led by a woman named Lynn. Linda. Not only did Linda remind us weekly that junior high would be the hardest years of our lives, but she also told us that we would likely be crying ourselves to sleep every night. During that summer between 6th and 7th grade, I didn't believe what she was saying. I couldn't picture a world where I would have a reason to cry every night. But after I started at a new school in the fall, where I experienced real bullying for the first time in my life, combined with my first real adolescent growth spurt that left my legs in extreme pain almost nightly, her prophecy soon became my reality. After another small group meeting where she lamented about how Timothy McVeigh was going to hell and how sad that was, she held me back after class and told me that I should write to him in prison and get him to accept Jesus before he met his fate with capital punishment. I was horrified. I barely even knew what the Oklahoma City bombing was due to the lack of TV and newspaper at my house. I was also horrified at the idea of having to save this random person. I'd already forcibly converted the one friend on my street who wasn't from a church-going family, and I felt so awkward and cringy the entire time I was doing it. I couldn't imagine evangelizing to a total stranger and a terrorist at that. Her assignment haunted me for weeks. I felt a terrible amount of guilt for not doing it, but I knew I wouldn't. I couldn't. Eventually, the guilt died down as I went on about my life, at least until June 12th, 2001, when I was on vacation in California. I happened to see the front page of a newspaper while walking with my cousin to a donut shop. Shout out to Brittany, one of my first subscribers on this channel. If you're still here with me, please give me a Halloween treat by liking this video. I really appreciate it. Splashed across the front page of the Los Angeles Times that day was a large headline.
headline announcing that McVeigh had been put to death the day before. It immediately felt like there was a large rock in my stomach and the prospect of donuts was no longer appealing. I pretended like I hadn't seen the paper though, not wanting to have the discussion with my cousin that it was my fault that this domestic terrorist was in hell. I mean, Yes, it's comical at this point, what with the fact that I know hell doesn't exist. But you have to remember, I wasn't able to fully deprogram myself of hell fear until 2020, two full years after I was finally comfortable saying out loud that I was no longer a Christian and that I knew hell didn't exist. It was still something I was traumatized by enough to have fear about, though. And why was that exactly? Let's get back to Jack Chick and his tracks for the answer. But first, another Halloween tract. This tract is called Boo. It's basically a ripoff of the Jason series. It's set at a camp, Camp Basilbub, get it? I wish I didn't, where people were murdered the prior Halloween. It's a slasher comic that takes us through the trope of another murderous rampage happening on the anniversary of the first one. There's a lot more talk of blood sacrifice in this tract, though, and in the end, the murderer turns out to be the actual devil inside the pumpkin head suit. Cool. Jack Thomas Chick was born on April 13th, 1924, in Boyle Heights, a neighborhood in Los Angeles, California. After he gained a two-year education in drama at the Pasadena Playhouse Theater and then serving in the U.S. Army during World War II, Chick credited his time overseas for inspiring him to translate his tracks into many different languages and said that he had a special burden for missions and missionaries. Oh, evangelicals and their special burdens. If I had a nickel for every time, I suck at doing doofenshmirtz, but you know what I'm saying. Boom! Wow! If I had a nickel for every time I was doomed by a puppet, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it happened twice, right? Evangelicals and their special burdens. Oh, it's a thing. After the war, he went back to the Pasadena Playhouse to work and met his wife, Lola Lynn Priddle, whom he credited with being instrumental in his salvation. It was Priddle and her parents that introduced Chick to Charles Fuller's Old Time Radio Hour, during an episode of which he ended up converting to Fuller's brand of evangelical fundamentalist Christianity. Fuller himself would go on to establish Fuller Theological Seminary, as we know, which is still in Pasadena to this day. Following his conversion, Chick wanted to evangelize as his new faith commanded him to do, but he was too shy to talk to people directly about religion. After hearing from the missionary Bob Hammond about how the Chinese Communist Party had gained real influence among Chinese people via the use of small comic books, he established Chick Publications in Rancho Cucamonga, California in 1970. Initially, Chick wrote and illustrated all of the comics on his own, but eventually hired another artist to work with him. Chick was known for maintaining a private life and rarely gave interviews, but he remained the driving force behind Chick Publications and was involved in the creation and distribution of his tracks until his passing in 2016. Before we go over the major controversies surrounding Chick's publications, let's cover another Halloween tract. This one's called The Devil's Night and it is so stupid. It's about an elementary age girl who hates Halloween and has a teacher who's forcing her to participate in a Halloween costume contest at school. As a workaround, she ends up wearing a Santa Claus costume, which really pisses the teacher off. I think it's funny because like this girl's supposed to be like such a Christian and she comes in like secular Christmas Santa but okay, whatever. The teacher thinks the girl is being a total sassy brat, and then after school, the Halloween hater evangelizes to a classmate on the way home, with lines that include but aren't limited to. Lots of kids disappear before Halloween, Buffy. Remember those satanic priests? And also, teens everywhere are going into both white and black witchcraft, and both really serve the devil. Like, when I was reading these things as a 12-year-old, I believed every single word of it, because why wouldn't I? I believed everything that my parents and the authorities around me said. Why wouldn't I? I just, I'm speechless at this point, looking back on it. If I had a kid who was a 12-year-old who had access to these kind of tracks without my knowledge, I would be so mad if I found out. I mean, not that I would be taking my kid to church anyways, but you know what I'm saying. While Chick Tracks gained a dedicated following among some conservative Christian groups, they also drew significant criticism for their provocative and divisive content. Many people found the tracks to be offensive and prejudiced, as they often portrayed non-Christian religions to 
denominations and lifestyles in an extremely negative light. There are so many controversies regarding the themes of the tracks and the words he uses, the way he draws certain ethnicities. There's no way we can cover all of them in depth here, so I'm going to try and do a quick speed run through the highlights. The Southern Poverty Law Center designated Chick Publications as an active hate group due to its extreme anti-Catholic, anti-Muslim, and anti-homosexual rhetoric. The conspiracies discussed in many of the tracks are based largely on the testimony of people who claim to have been members of these groups before converting to evangelical fundamentalism. A comic called The Prophet contained a fantastic tale by Alberto Rivera, who claimed the papacy helped start Islam, which we know is not true. Six of Jack Chick's comics feature Rivera, an anti-Catholic religious activist who claimed to have been a Jesuit priest before becoming a Christian fundamentalist. Rivera was the source of many of Chick's conspiracy theories about the Vatican and the Jesuits. 20 of the tracks are dedicated to anti-Catholic rhetoric with titles like Are Roman Catholics Christians? Arguing that they're not. The Death Cookie, a polemic against the Catholic Eucharist. And Why is Mary Crying? Which argues that Mary does not support the veneration Catholicism gives her. Throughout the 10 anti-Muslim tracks, the most outrageous titles include Allah Had No Son, in which a Muslim is converted to Christianity when he is told that Allah has origins as a pagan moon god. Christians would be really surprised to learn where the origins of their faith come from. Just going to throw that out there. And another title called Camels in the Tent claims that Muslim immigration will lead to the establishment of Sharia law in the United States and the forceful conversion of non-Muslims to Islam. In 1974, the Iowa State University Christian Fellowship passed out copies of over 20 different chick tracks, including copies of one called The Gay Blade, a tract that warned of a gay agenda to push for same-sex marriage and urged homosexuals to repent so they could make it into heaven. The wild thing about this tract is that it borrowed several of its frames from a 1971 Life magazine photo essay on the gay liberation movement, but the images were altered to make the gay men look more stereotypically feminized. Members of the Gay People's Liberation Alliance and the Women's Coalition protested the tract's distribution, claiming that they provided an inaccurate representation of gay and bisexual people. Chick published several anti-evolution tracks as well, but the one called Big Daddy? is still the most widely distributed anti-evolution booklet of all time. Critics point out that this tract mainly uses Kent Hovind as a reference, even though this man has no degrees from accredited institutions in the relevant fields, that the thesis of the comic is considered to be of very poor quality, and that his claims are at odds with published statements of experts in the field. Chick was well known for his vast conspiracy theories and belief that secret groups like the Illuminati control the world in order to advance their evil schemes. I know that recent groups like QAnon on and Alex Jones followers may seem like new things, but fundamentalists have been lost in the sauce of the conspiracy game for a very long time. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Serious crap. In the tract called The Broken Cross, Chick introduced John Todd, a conspiracy theorist and supposedly former Grand Druid priest, who claims that secret groups, including witches and the Illuminati, are working to advance evil all over the world. The version of Christianity presented within Chick's tract really emphasizes the role of Satan and his demons. Gargoyles, psychics, everything's on God. The main evil in his comics, where Satan is the force behind all major global events like Adam and Eve eating the apple in the garden, Noah's flood, etc. And God's actions are seen as reactions to whatever the devil is up to, which creates this cosmic storyline throughout that they're rivals in the battle for the fate of humanity. The fourth Halloween tract I want to show you today is called Spooky, and I think this one might be the most stupid one of the four I've covered today. A boy is visiting his aunt for the week and ends up talking to her spooky next door neighbor, who celebrates Halloween by putting up a haunted house for the neighborhood. Unclear whether or not this is the same neighborhood haunt where the kid ran into the street and got killed, but either way, the neighbor taunts the kid for being a... So of course the kid goes to the haunted house. The neighbor dresses in a devil costume and when the kid comes through his haunted house, he's told that it's the devil's birthday. The kid is so freaked that he tells his aunt about the whole thing and of course she then leads him to Christ with such amazing lines like, God allowed his son to be born as a baby. He chose a virgin lady who'd never been with a man and he put his son inside her. Ew. 
and the baby Jesus was born. When the devil found out what happened, he was furious. That child must die. But Jesus' father up in heaven stopped the devil from killing baby Jesus so he could grow up and save us. Okay, so is Chick's theology that like the devil was puppeting King Herod? Or I'm confused because like we all know King Herod was trying to kill who the supposed wise men called the king of the Jews when Herod was the king of the Jews and felt threatened by this. So I don't know what the devil has to do with anything. My personal favorite line, though, from the conversion is people liked sinning. They hated Jesus and wanted him dead. <laughs> sure, I'm so sure that's what it was. It's not like he was an apocalyptic prophet with enough of a following to become a threat to the peace of the local government or anything. Anyway, once the kid is a Christian, he bullies Spooky Neighbor into going to church with him by saying that he's the if he doesn't go. Spooky Neighbor goes to church to prove he's not a and while he's there, he has a vision of himself in the fiery lakes of hell, as one does, and converts on the spot to make it go away. You can see how these tracks are sensationalist. Their theology pushes beyond even normal fundamentalist theology. And just imagine an entire wall display of endless copies of these tracks. Chick made over 200 of them. I don't know how many were in that room, but you know, I would pick up two or three every Sunday morning to read inside my Bible during you know, the youth group talk because I was always so bored at church, even though I knew I could never admit that. Anyway, let's go back to Linda, the youth group leader. After the whole Timothy McVeigh thing went down, I happened to pick up a tract called The Letter. Now, this one is, and I'm pretty comfortable saying that this one tied with the Timothy McVeigh thing is the absolute root of my religious trauma. The letter is about a woman who has a dream that her best friend is in hell because she never witnessed to her. Then when she wakes up in the morning, she decides she's going to call her best friend in two days and do that. But then when she calls in two days, she found out that her best friend is dead and in hell and it's all her fault, just the way she dreamed it. For those of you who want to stick around, my wife and I are going to read the whole thing for you and put up all of the pictures on the screen. Thank you for being here with me today. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you for seeing me. Thank you for allowing me to share a lot of my truth with you because it is a truth that would not be accepted by the people who were around me during that period of my life. So thank you for letting me share this. It's another one of those things that, you know, it's just a step into sharing part of my story, getting some of it off of my chest and formulating my thoughts about how I really feel about it. If you'd like to support me, please go ahead and give me a follow. If you've already done that, hit the notification bell. As followers of Assigned Christian at Birth, you'll get two uploads a week packed full of deconstruction content, both on Fridays, where it's either a theology episode or a politics episode or a pop culture episode. It could really be anything. And then on Sundays, I have this podcast, Morning Thoughts, when I talk about the specific thing in fundamentalism that I have really been working on over the past week. And now for a special Halloween treat, a dramatic reading of the chick track that traumatized me the most and added to my major guilt over being the reason I thought that Timothy McVeigh was in hell. Here we go. Excuse me, ma'am. I'd like to give you a little book to read. I'm concerned about your soul. No, thank you. I'm sure you'd enjoy reading this track. I said no. I find your method both disgusting and offensive. I know what you're doing trying to save my soul, and I resent it. I'm a Christian, and what you're doing cheapens the gospel. I let people see how I live. I don't cram it down their throats like you do. You, sir, are a fanatic and an embarrassment. Well, to some people, I guess I am. Just like Peter, Paul, and James, they were considered fanatics, too. How dare you place yourself with the apostles? You're sick! Get away from me or I'll call the police. It sounds like you're ashamed of the gospel, ma'am. Oh, Lord, I'm so glad I'm not like that man. <sighs> I was so humiliated. Oh, I hate people like that. Mildred goes to sleep and dreams a strange dream. It begins in the regions of the damned, where all those who die in their sins go. She dreamed that a letter had been written down in that awful place by some tortured soul, and a request had been made that the letter be delivered to someone living above. This is most unusual, but your request has been granted. We shall carry this letter to its final destination. 
The two messengers began their long journey through the caverns of the lost. They passed by sights never dreamed of by those living above. It was a nightmare of screams, curses, thunderous noises, with the stench of sulfur and thick darkness. Jesus warned us about this place. She dreamed of the untold multitudes down there who had rebelled against God and died in their sins. They had either rejected or disregarded his love gift of eternal life in heaven to save them from this terrible place. We're almost there. Mildred knew that those lost souls would spend eternity in darkness, weeping and wailing and gnashing their teeth. The two messengers finally reached the entrance. This way. The journey is almost over. At last we are here. Wait for me while I deliver the letter. Her dream continues. Yes, Pastor? I called to thank you for your generous gift to the church. I am so grateful. Well, I felt it was my Christian duty. Later. Mildred. Mildred! Ugh, something smells like sulfur. Eek! Good. He's made contact. Who, who are you? What do you want? (gasps) I am a messenger from the damned. Here is the letter I was to deliver. It's from a friend in hell. She dreams on. I must have had a nightmare. I'll never take that stupid tranquilizer again. What's that? It's a letter. Am I going mad? I wonder what it says. Let's see. It says... My friend, I stand in judgment now, and I feel that you're to blame somehow. While on this earth I walked with you day by day, and never did you point the way. You knew the Lord in truth and glory, but never did you tell the story. My knowledge then was very dim. You could have led me safe to him. Though we lived together here on earth, you never told me of your second birth. And now I stand this day condemned because you failed to mention him. You taught me many things, that's true. I called you friend and trusted you. But I learned now that it's too late. You could have kept me from this fate. We walked by day and night, and yet you showed me not the light. And you let me live, love, and die, and all the while you knew I'd never live on high. Yes, I called you friend in life. I trusted you in joy and strife. And yet, in coming to this end, I see you really weren't my friend. Signed, Francis. What a ghastly dream! I'm wet and shaky! Oh dear, oh dear, it seemed so real. Oh Lord, the last thing I want is for Francis to end up in that awful place where the Bible says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Even if it costs our friendship, I'll tell her about Jesus, how he left heaven and was born of a virgin. I'll tell her how Jesus died on the cross for her, and he shed his precious blood to wash away her sins. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish in the lake of fire, but have everlasting life in heaven. I'll tell her how he arose from the dead and went back to heaven. I'll tell Francis that when she makes Jesus her savior and lord, she will go to heaven. Yes, I'll call Francis Monday night. She'll listen to me. I know she will. Monday night. Hello, is Francis there? Mildred, didn't you hear? Saturday night, Francis and John's car skittered in the rain and they hit a tree. John's still alive, but Francis died instantly. Oh my god in heaven, she's lost, and I didn't tell her. I was afraid. Thus saith the Lord, when I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at thine hand. Ezekiel 3.18 <laughs> I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking frogs gay. Do you understand that? Turn, turn the, the freaking frogs gay. Serious crap. Gay. Frogs freaking frogs. Bow, bow. It's not funny. I'm going to say it real slow for you. Gay.